we are in Haitian with each other and fall to honor your commandment to love. Our idols fascinate and distract us from your grateful path. Forgive us. Turn us from our sinful ways. Set us free in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news that you all have been forgiven. You all have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Find peace within that forgiveness and let us share the joy of that peace with one another. May the Lord, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all now and forever. us close as way. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. Our first reading today is from the Psalms. It's Psalm number 77. Now we'll read verses 1 and 2 and 11 through 20. Listen now for God's word for you. I cry out loud to God, aloud to God that he may hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the people. With your strong arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O oh God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. The very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Friend, this is the words of the Lord. topic of the sermon today, the New Testament reading, is from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him. 
because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another man he said, Follow me. To another he said, Follow me. And he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Friends, the word of the Lord. So the beginning of this passage, we are, we are told that it's time for Jesus to be taken up. We can interpret this in a couple of different ways. We can interpret this as Jesus being taken to the mountain of skulls to be crucified. Or we can interpret this as Jesus being taken up to heaven. No matter how we interpret this, we are led to the same conclusion that Jesus is on his way to his demise. It's stated pretty perfectly. This is, this is a great statement that we are told that Jesus has his face set to go to Jerusalem. Have you ever seen somebody under extreme duress? extremely agitated, worried, scared. You can actually see it on their face. When you approach them, you can tell that there's something wrong. This is what's being said about Jesus. Jesus knows his fate. He knows what's coming. He knows what is to become of him. He knows the pain, the suffering, the humiliation that's on the doorstep. He's playing it over and over again in his head. It's eating him up from the inside out. He's nervous. He's scared. He may be downright miserable at this point. And everybody can see that on his face. But he was determined. He knew it was God's will. He knew he must go to the cross. He must go to the cross to save all of God's children for all generations to come. Jesus and his followers have been preaching, doing miracles in Galilee. And the shortest distance between Galilee to Jerusalem is through Samaria. Samaria is tucked into the middle of modern-day Israel and Palestine in the foothills that are crossed when you go from one to the other, right in the center of the West Bank. This is a place that Jewish people would avoid at all costs. As they traveled around this region, they would travel around Samaria because they were told to avoid Samaritans at all costs. They were told in the scripture, they were told by the religious leaders. They considered the Samaritans as half-breeds. During the Exodus, when Israel's whites were sent out of Jerusalem, some of them mixed with these pagans in this region. Hence the development, the formation of Samaria. They built this little community there where they still practiced being faithful Jews, but they weren't considered by the Jews to be Jewish. They were considered dirty, ugly, and just outright sinners. 
So this community of half-breeds, they did not have a very favorable view of Jew and vice versa. So as these Jewish disciples approached the land before Jesus came, it was a very negative feeling why they were there. And as Jesus approached, they seen this on his face. They seen that Jesus had his face on Jerusalem and they took offense to that. Because Jerusalem was the center of all of Jewish belief. It was the spiritual capital of all that was righteous in the eyes of the Jews. And they were truly offended about that because they felt that there was a mountain in their region. It was called Gizim. And they felt that that was the true sanctuary of God. And they felt that's where Jesus should focus on. Because Jesus was liked by the Samaritans. We heard a story of the Good Samaritan and Jesus approached this, approached a woman at Jacob's well, a Samaritan woman, and was very kind to her and announced for the first time that he was the Messiah to a Samaritan. She went back to the village and she proclaimed what she had heard, that Jesus would be teaching all the people about the kingdom of God. So he was liked by the Samaritans. But here his face wasn't focused on them. And I'm sure they were hurt and they turned away. Now his followers were offended by the offense of them. They didn't feel that Samaritans were acting right in the face of their Lord. So they asked Jesus if, if they should command fire down to consume them because of this rejection. But Jesus rebukes them. See, Jesus loves the Samaritans. He loves the oppressed. He loves that the Samaritans were different. He loves that they were surviving and doing their best for their families and for their people. And he knows when it is all said and done, that they will believe in the living, loving, and forgiving God that he is. That he is the God of second chances. So he leaves them to peace and he moves it on his way. Now as we read along in this reading today, this is where it gets really good. Jesus and his disciples, they leave and they're traveling down a road and three men at different times approach Jesus. And the first man to approach him says, I will follow you wherever you go. And I gotta say, I, I, I always not just appreciate God's answers, Jesus' answers in the Bible, but I strive to hear them and I strive to find them. I always love the way he answers questions. I find it not only amusing, but fulfilling and enlightening. And this one gave me goosebumps. He's just speaking in this awesome persona that he carries with him. He says to the man, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has no way to lay his head. What Jesus is telling this man is, it's not easy. To follow him means you will be rejected. It means people will hate you. It means people will question your actions. Following Jesus is not easy. You've heard me call it the long and winding road, but some call it a radical road. Following Jesus is radical. It was radical then, and it's radical today. As Christians, our needs need to become subservient to the needs of others. We must respond to violence with peace. We must love the those who do harm to us. It's a radical road. We must not judge our brothers and sisters. 
all those things are pretty radical. It's against our nature. Fatherly Jesus can look crazy or irrational to other people we come across. But here today, we know it's the only way. It's the only way that our society will live, will survive, will strive, is to be radical followers of Christ. We must be radical to truly follow him. We know that choosing a life of discipleship can be cannot be anything other than the example of Christ. His own example has given us life, has shown us sacrifice. And for us to follow him, we must too be radical. We must be known by others around us to be radical. Our friends must consider us radical. Our family, our coworkers, must consider us radical. Because if they don't believe we are doing enough, maybe we need to shift gears. Because as I see it, as I read and watch the news, we keep getting farther and farther away from God. And without God, hope will fail. Hope will fail to exist. And the more we lose hope, the more radical we need to be as Christians. The second man approaches Jesus, and Jesus says to him, follow me. And he says, I will follow you, but first I must go and bury my father. And Jesus responds to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, I don't think for a second Jesus is being cruel or anti-family. This statement from him is one of urgency. Jesus knows that there are great numbers of people that need to be saved. People need to hear the good news. And at this time, it is only time for radical action. Jesus is making the point that the dead are already dead. They're already gone. They don't need to hear the good news. But those who, re re those who remain on this earth, they will need to know about God's kingdom. And we cannot wait to spread it. I recently heard a spokesperson from Africa Inland Mission. And that person said that in the world today, Today, 2022, there are still one billion people who have never heard of Jesus or his gospel. In a time of, in this time of immense technology, this time of TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and still right now, one billion people have not received the good news. Jesus is saying we must be radical. The third man says to Jesus, hey, I saw what happened to you back there in Samaria. I will follow you, but first, let me say goodbye to my family. Jesus' response to him is a little harsh. But he gives him a little, another one of those answers that gives me goosebumps. He says to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom. You would hope that Jesus would let somebody say goodbye to their family, but here Jesus is making a very important point. And his point is, is as Christians, it's best that we never look back. That we always push forward, collecting wisdom, getting closer to God. Just like the man who is plowing his field. If he's plowing his field and he looks back, his plow is going to go off the course and his field is going to be a mess. We can equate that to our lives. If we take our eyes off of God, our field will be a mess. So we cannot afford to look back. We must realize that our sins, our mistakes in life are forgiven. 
and we must look forward not to sin again. That whole belief system is not new to the Bible. John the Baptist preached it at the very beginning as he was paving the way. John the Baptist preached repentance. And although the dictionary has a definition for repentance, as Christians, we believe that it is sincerely being apologetic and remorseful for our sin, but concentrating never to do it again. Always looking forward. Now, as I was going through hard times, when I went to a pastor friend of mine and asked him what I need to do to correct some of my problems, to, I was struggling with sin that I had committed, bad things I've done to people I love. He told me every morning, sit down, and think about the man you want to be today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about yesterday. Look to today. One day at a time. Always forward. And when I think about the cancel culture movement, I know the cancel culture movement can be extreme. It can destroy lives. People have taken it to incredible measures. But one part of the cancel culture movement that I think is beneficial is the removing of the statues in the South. These statues of questionable origin or questionable behavior of the men who are depicted in these statues. And I think this is one thing that was needed for us to move on, to look forward, is to get rid of constant reminders of negative things in our history, of sin, of just bad decision making as Americans. And those who are recovering, those who are recovering from alcoholism or drug addiction, after the acknowledgement of their problem, of their weakness, they need to make amends. And after they make an amends, they are instructed to build new one day at a time. One day becomes two, two days become 30. 30 days become six months clean. Six months become one year clean. Always one day at a time. If you know anybody in a program and you ask them how many days clean they are, they will be able to tell you exactly how many days clean they are. And they are looking forward to the next day to tell you one more. Jesus tells us there is no hope in the past. There is only hope in the future. We have to look towards making tomorrow better than today. We cannot change what has happened. We can only prevent it from happening again. It's a radical road, but it's nothing new. Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. And sometimes we just need to be reminded that we are called to do the same. There cannot be any more a first, let me do this, or let me do that. The only thing to do first is to follow in the radical road of Christ. I don't think God wants us to leave our families, to sell all of our possessions. But I do honestly believe in our lives, God must be first. We must choose to walk a radical path through the kingdom and live righteously. We need to set aside the importance of our maternal, not our maternal, our material possessions. We can't put so much emphasis on our monetary value. God needs to be first. And what Jesus taught us needs to be first in our lives. That radical path 
must be paved in service to others. It must be paved in love. The kind of love that he had in us. That's the only way that it's going to get better. We all need to come together as Christians, not only to be a family within ourselves, but to spread the word radically in what we have found, in what we believe. And it may not mean that people come to church. It may not mean that people worship God. But if they just believe in loving each other and equality and compassion, it will get better. Self-righteousness, evil, will not win over good. And for all that, I am thankful. Heavenly God, I bow my knees before you. I bow my knees in prayer and praise that you lead and guide me today in all that I say and do. And may I walk in the spirit and truth. So today, I receive your gentle guidance. And tomorrow, I receive your gentle guidance. And as every day I count until I meet you, you are with me and you guide me on the path that you have set forward to me. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Friends, now comes the time where we lift up our prayers. We lift up our prayers to the Lord, our prayers of concern, our prayers of joy. And I'd like to ask you all if there are any prayers that you have that we need to lift up to God today. Everybody's great, huh? It's a great summer day. Awesome. Let us pray. Gracious God, on this awesome summer day that we get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. We ask you to hold in your hands the women of this country, that they may find strength and hope and sometimes the most difficult decisions that they will ever make. We'd like to ask you for strength in following your lead and being radical people, radical children. We'd like to ask for hope for the hungry, the homeless, those sick in hospitals, those sick in care facilities, those struggling with mental illness, those struggling with addiction, may they all find peace and healing in your name. I'd like to thank you for the church, for the family, the friends that come together that come together to share ideas, that come together to share their feelings about topics that affect us today. We'd like to remember the people in the Ukraine who are still fighting for their freedoms. We'd like to pray for the people who have fled that country and are looking for safety and food and housing and 
countries all over the world, just in the hope that they may return. We'd like to pray for the people who are experiencing the damage of fires in the east. People are experiencing extreme heat in the west and the south in our country. And we'd like to give thanks for everything you have to offer us. Open our eyes, open our hearts so we may receive all the words, all the directions, all the love that you have to offer freely. If only we open the door. As we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the first word of the Bible are about God's own generosity. He gave us the gift of a beautiful, diverse creation. He gave us our loved ones. He gave us the good green earth and the animals that live here with us. On this, the Lord's day, may we come together to thank God and offer our gifts so that the ministry of this church will continue to grow and be a blessing to our community. Let us now gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. blessed us each and every one of us with gifts to serve and share. May the offerings we present today be 
be used to further your kingdom and build your beloved community. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Our closing hymn today is number 476, printed in your blood. sisters, as we go from this place today, let us never forget that Christ is the foundation of all we do. Let the world see that you are Christians. Be proud to show the word, the world who you belong to. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Thank you.